So 8-2 is building upon those ideas we talked about this morning. Everything in 8-1 is about the contract once it is a contract. 8-2 backs up a step. And I often debate whether 8-2 should come before 8-1. Um, it's kind of, I've taught it both ways and I, I'm not sure it makes much of a difference, quite honestly. But 8-2 backs up a step in the process to the offer. 8-2 is all about getting us under contract. 8-1 was about, you know, what kind of contract we have once the agreement is formed. 8-2 is about the offer and acceptance process and the, the, the process we go through to get to a contract. And so I'm gonna give you those same three slides that we looked at this morning and, and just kind of reset your brain. Every contract has to start with an offer. And so that's what we're gonna deal with here in 8-2, that, that offer, you know, that, you know, that will you do this type moment. And sometimes folks, there's not immediate agreement. And sometimes they don't just say yes right away. Sometimes there's negotiation that goes back and forth. Sometimes there's counter offers. Sometimes people have to think about it. And we have to talk about that process. And of course, we hope to get to that yes moment, which is the moment of acceptance of the contract. Acceptance is the same thing as forming a binding valid contract. And eventually, obviously get to closing, which is the, the end goal of any contract. So again, just sort of this timeline reminder of how this thing's going to play out. We have to start with an offer. Now, we have looked at these suffixes before. The OR person starts any process. Grantor, they start the transfer of title. The EE person finishes the process. They're the one at the end of the process. So if you're talking about grantor, grantee, and transferring title, the grantor is the one who starts the transfer of title. The grantee is the one who's taking title, right? If we talk about leases, who starts the lease process? It's the lessor, the landlord, right? They landlord, offer yeah. the property for lease. And then the lessee is the one who finishes the process. They come along and they accept the lease. Well, when we're trying to create a contract, we need to have the offer process and that gives us an offer or and an offer E. Always offers flow from the offer or to the offer E. That is always the flow. We're going to go from offer or to offer E for an offer. But notice here, we still don't have a contract until the offeree does what in return? What does the offeree have to do? Sign the in acceptance. They have to communicate acceptance. They have to accept it and then communicate that acceptance. So the offeree or makes the offer, the offeree accepts the offer, hopefully, they don't have to. And then the offeree has to communicate or tell or inform who, who are they telling? Who is that communication going back to folks? Offer. The buyer, the offeror. The offeror. I don't want you to use buyer and seller in this section. And I'll tell okay. you why. And I'll tell you why. It's, it's a, it, I'm, Aaron, I'm glad you did it right away. You actually, <laughs> you, you actually did a good thing. Well, I had to process it because I can't figure it out. Go ahead. No, no, I, I, I got you. And it's, and it's a big temptation to use buyer and seller. Mm -hmm. Here's why. Let, let's put labels on these things. Okay? That's what I have to label it. Yeah. If we start with the offer or that's usually the buyer, you're not wrong, right? Right. And the offeree would usually be the seller, correct? Correct. Here's why I don't want you to use the labels buyer and seller though. What if the seller makes a counter offer? What if the oh. seller reverses the process? Guess who is now the offer or? The, the seller. seller. The seller oh, is and the offeree is the buyer. You see why I said caution you against using those terms? Because yeah. these roles can switch if there's a counter offer. Okay. So we have to be real careful of that. Those roles can switch. 
as, and we're going to talk a lot about this idea of acceptance and communication of acceptance. So don't worry. I feel like you've missed something. We're going to, this is going to be a, a topic that we're going to revisit many times over the next little while here. So to me, it's so funny, Travis, how like in detail and in depth, if we get about these terms, like, I feel like I've never really said in real life, like, oh, well, this person's the offer or this person's the offer. Yeah, right. And and I think a lot of this is understanding th this is the terminology that would matter in a court of law. Um, you uh, know, it, th this is the terminology. A, a judge would not want to know who the buyer and the seller are. They'd want to know who the offer or was and who the offer he was, because a judge would recognize those roles could change. For your purposes, the reason it's important is for test-taking purposes, obviously, because yeah. they're going to use those terms offer or and offer e. So a sales contract is a specific type of contract. In 8.1, we were talking about contracts. So I want you to think like 10,000 foot view of 8.1. Everything we talked about in 8.1, does it apply to a contract to sell a house? Yeah. Yes. Yes. All those contract rules. Does it apply to a lease? No. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. because 8.1 was all about general contract law. Does it uh, apply contract. to a landscaping contract? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. because 8.1, all of those things, whether they're valid contracts, whether they are executed or executory, whether they are bilateral or unilateral, all of those things apply to any type of contract for any reason on planet Earth. If you, if you signed a bill of sale to sell a car, would the things that we uh, talked about in 8.1 apply? Yes. Yes. Sure, because that's a contract. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Would the things we talked about in 8.1 apply to a listing agreement? Yes. Yeah, yes. it's a contract. Yes. It's a contract between a, a, a seller and a firm. It would apply to a buyer agency agreement. So now what I want to point out to you is we are now zeroing in on one particular type of sales contract or one particular type of contract, a sales contract. And I'll give you a little sneak preview of what's to come. When we get to 8.3, we're going to zoom in even further. Right now, we're zooming in from every contract in the world down to one type of contract, which is the what? Sales contract? The sales contract. When we get to 8.3, we're going to zoom into one specific sales contract. We're going to leave every other sales contract behind and talk about one specific one. So what we're doing is going from very generic down to more and more specific types of agreements. So right now we're leaving behind leases. We're leaving behind buyer agency agreements. We're leaving behind listing agreements. We're leaving behind every other type of contract on the planet, planet except for the contracts involving a buyer and a seller in the sale of real estate. That's what we're about to focus on. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. We are no longer talking generic contracts anymore. We are talking specifically about sales contracts. And this is to deal with the sale of real estate specifically. This is just a reminder of something we mentioned earlier. We as licensees are not allowed to draft language. Now, drafting language includes writing contract language. It includes crossing things out that are already in a contract um, in the preprinted language. Um, now, we can cross out things that we could have filled in in the first place. If something's not fill in the blank, like example, purchase price is fill in the blank. Can we write in a purchase price? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 And if they decide on a different purchase price, can we cross out that purchase price and put a new current purchase price in there? Yes. Sure. Yes, because that's still a blank we were meant to operate in. Does that make sense for everybody? When I talk about you can't cross things out, I'm talking about the fact that you can't cross out the pre-printed words, the ones that are already formatted on the document. But you cannot do that for a client or a customer. However, remind me again, is there any time that a licensee can fill in or write contract language, draft mm -hmm. contract language? Yes. If the seller, yeah. if the, if the client the buyer or seller. If the licensee themselves is the buyer or seller. That's the only time, that's the only time you as a licensee can make a change to a sales contract. If you yourself are the buyer or seller. 
which also means if our buyers and sellers, our clients, our customers want us to make these changes, we can't make those changes, but can they make the changes for themselves? Yes. 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 Can we advise them on what changes to make? No. 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 Because that would be given legal advice. So good. I want to make sure you got that sort of nailed down in your in your in your brain. The idea of offer and acceptance or mutual assent starts with an offer or. The offer or makes the offer to the offeree. That is an always thing that never changes. Who is the offer or and who is the offeree might change. But offers are always made by who? The offer or. The offer or. Can a seller fill out an offer and send it to a buyer? Yes. 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 Sure they can. You need to understand these, these terms, folks, are not locked into people. Whoever is making the offer is the what? Offer or. Is the offer or. Let, me, let me tell you how some of y'all just responded and to show you how silly your response was. Some of, you, some of you just responded when I said, can the seller make an offer? Like you would have responded 50 years ago when I said, can the woman pay for dinner when a couple goes out on a date? <laughs> Wow. And y'all went, no, oh my gosh, of course they can. Can a seller be the offer or folks? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes. Anybody making an offer is an offer or, whether they're the buyer or seller. Now we do know that traditionally and most commonly what happens in these transactions, who most commonly makes an offer? The buyer. The buyer. The buyer does. The buyer does, right? Listen, I've had situations where not necessarily in housing or in, in real estate, but I've had situations where sellers made me an offer. I, I've had that happen, when it happened a lot when I was shopping for cars. How many of you have been shopping for cars and you test drive it and you go back there and you talk to the salesperson and they're trying to, you know, well, well don't you like it? And, and you say, yeah, I'm really on the fence. And then they come back and say, I tell you what I can do. We can knock $2,000 off of it if you buy it today. Well, isn't that the seller making a what? An offer. An offer. An offer. An offer. And, and they can. They can. The seller can be the offer or they're not generally in real estate transactions, but they certainly could be. Is everybody all right with that so far? Easy, Lola. Okay. Yeah. Easy. Lola. Now, the offer E is the one receiving the offer. They have a choice. When the offeree gets that offer, they can either accept it or they can reject it. There's actually two ways that they can reject it. They can just straight up say, you know what? I reject your offer. What's the more common way though that an offeree actually rejects an offer? What most commonly happens when oh, offerees, when they don't counter accept offer. Counter counter offer. Offer. make a counter offer? You need to make sure that you re recognize that a counter offer is first and foremost a rejection of the offer that came first. And here's the thing to understand about offers, folks. They are very fragile. Offers fall apart at nothing. If an offer e counter offers, is the original offer still in existence or has it been obliterated? It's no. been obliterated. obliterated. It's been obliterated. It never happened. So let me give you a practical test question that comes from something like that. So a simple idea like that. Rachel receives an offer to purchase on her home. She's the seller. She's the offeree. She receives an offer to purchase on her home. She counter offers with a, a sales price $3,000 higher. Three days later, she hasn't heard from the buyer. So she goes back and signs the buyer's original offer with the original terms on it. Do we have a contract? Nope. No. 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 Because the minute she made that counter offer, it was like that first offer was never, ever made. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. There's no... Uh, there's no takesies backsies when it comes to <laughs> offers and counter counter offers kill the offer that came before. So right there as a practical real world thing, is there risk that we should explain to our clients 
in making counter offers because your clients will look at it as, oh, well, there's no harm. Let's make a counter offer. Well, there is potential harm there. We need to really think about that because we are basically letting the other party off the hook, aren't we, if we make a counter offer? Remember, if they've made an offer, if we accept it, aren't we under contract? Yes. yes. But the minute we counter offer, we're basically saying we got to restart this whole process again. And the other party may not be willing to agree to the, could there be buyers, just as a practical question, who make you an offer and they think they've already made you a great offer. You counter offer them and then they get, what is the technical term? Butt hurt, I believe, <laughs> is the technical legal terminology. <laughs> And they aren't willing to come back and honor even their original offer just because you made them mad with the counter offer. Are there people out there like that? Yes. 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 yes, absolutely. And so I always have this discussion with sellers uh, of mine who want to make counter offers that are not really that substantial. You know, it's one thing if you want to counter offer for $20,000 difference. Okay, well, that's fine because you weren't going to accept that original offer anyway. But when I present an offer to a seller, as an example, I recently presented one that was full price and cash. And the seller said, well, I see they want to close end of September. What do you think about counter offering? Let's close in October. That way we can use the house all through September. What do you think my advice was? You really going to take a chance on a $1.25 million cash buyer getting mad and walking away because you want an extra two weeks at the lake? Re really? Right. Mm -hmm. Because aren't we running that risk if we Absolutely. counter offer? Yeah. You know? yeah. Sign it. Sign it. That's what you do. You sign it. Because at that point, you can make it binding. Does everybody see the importance of counter offers and how they really do impact this process? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Good. Good. So when we talk about offer and acceptance, offers are going to be valid until one of two things happens. Either the offer is terminated, and we're going to talk about offers being terminated because offers are real fragile, because offers can be terminated either by the offer or, or by the offeree. But an offer is going to remain valid, outstanding, until it's either terminated or it becomes a contract. I'm going to say that again. It's going to remain outstanding until it either is terminated or it becomes a contract. Are buyers who make offers taking a risk if they don't, let's say you make an offer as a buyer and two days later, you haven't heard back from the seller. So you decide to move on and start making offers on other properties. Is that buyer taking a risk by leaving their offer hanging out there? Yes. Yeah. Yes, because the, the seller is still free to do what with it? Sign. Accept, Accept it. it. Accept, Accept it. it. Accept it. If if that buyer really wants to move on, what do we need to do? Contact the seller and say our offer is no longer what? Valid. Valid. No longer yeah. valid. So that would be an example of the offer or terminating the offer. We already talked about the best example, most common example of an offer e terminating the offer by making a counter offer. So the offer is very fragile, but it is going to stay out there until somebody either terminates it or accepts it. Um, acceptance is the signing of the contract by the offeree. Here's what I want you to envision. The offer or already signed the contract. Remember, real estate sales contracts, they have to be in writing, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. According to what law? Yes. The statute of fraud. That's the statute, the statute of fraud. Very good. Possible. Yeah. The statute of fraud says real estate sales contracts have to be in writing in order to be enforceable. So we know that that offer is in writing and we know it's already been signed by the offer or the offer or signs the offer folks as soon as they make the offer. If the offeree comes behind them and signs it without making any changes, how many signatures are now on an identical offer? Two. 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 Folks, that is an accepted offer. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why we call it offer and acceptance. It's one document, but with two people signing it. When mm -hmm. the offer or is signing it, what's the name of that document? Or what's the name of that process, rather? An offer to purchase. That's an offer, right? Yeah. 
when the offer e signs it, that's called acceptance. acceptance. Is everybody good with those two different terminologies? Yep. Okay. Offer or signs the offer. That's the offer part. Offer e signs it. That's the acceptance part. Now we have that proof when we go to court of mutual agreement to the terms, right? That the two parties were in agreement. And it's very key here. Recognize this. It's not acceptance, folks, if you make changes. If you make changes, it's a counter offer. So if the offeree signs it, but changes one thing, because they're going to do that to you on the test. They're going to say the offeree signed it, but changed the closing date. What did they actually do? Counter offer. Counter offer. Counter -offer. Counter -offer. They just became the offer or. And so now that's got to go back to the other side to be accepted. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because eventually what you have to have is signatures on an identical agreement. That's what that whole idea of mutual agreement means. However, we still are not quite at the point of contract. And that's where we have to center our conversation right now. Even though we have acceptance, we're not yet under contract. It seems like we would be. Let's play this out. Play it out. Hilda is our offer or. Okay. And so Hilda makes an offer to purchase. Let's see who we want to pick on here from uh, Howard. Howard is our seller, offer E. And Hilda, Hilda is our buyer, offer or. So Hilda signs an offer to purchase. And, you know, it includes purchase price and closing date and deposits and all those kinds of things. She submits it over to Howard, the offer E. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Howard reviews it, thinks about it for a day, signs it without making any changes. Mm -hmm. Is it accepted? Yes. Yes, it is accepted. It is accepted. Yes, but it's two signatures, yes. <laughs> it is two signatures on an identical document equals accepted. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes, but it is not yet binding. It's not yet a contract. We cannot put a sign in front of Howard's house that says under contract yet. In fact, Hilda could still back out and terminate her offer. It's not a contract yet. And here's why it's not a contract. Howard has not yet done the most important step along the way of forming a contract. He has not notified Hilda that her offer has been what? Accepted. 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 In order to bind Hilda to that, here's the problem. Is the, is the knowledge unbalanced at this point? Right mm -hmm. now, Howard knows yes. that this document has two signatures on it, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. But how many signatures is Hilda aware of? One. 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 That's not a contract, folks. Does that make sense for any, for everybody? Yeah. Yes. She can't be under contract until she knows she's under contract. So if Howard wants to make sure that Hilda is held responsible for her promises in that agreement, what's the next thing he's going to have to do? Pick up the phone and call her. Pick up the phone and call her, send her an email, send her a text message, send smoke signals, go yell it and outside of her window, whatever way he wants to choose to notify or communicate to Hilda, hey, I have accepted your offer. Now notice, and this is where people get hung up, the acceptance must be in writing. What is acceptance? When Howard, the offeree, does what? Signs the contract. Signs. Signs the contract. That's in writing. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. But does communication of acceptance have to be in writing? No. 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 Howard can communicate in any way he chooses back to Hilda that he has accepted her offer. Everybody good with that so far? Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to look at this note, this, this note down here at the bottom. And then we're going to do a little hypothetical situation with our uh, Howard and Hilda example here. It says offers can always be rescinded or taken back by the offer or at any time prior to the moment they become enforceable. 
So here's our scenario. Hilda's made her offer. Howard has reviewed it. He signed it without making any changes. Do we have an accepted offer? Yes. 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 Okay. Howard picks up the phone, dials Hilda's number. Hilda answers, but as she answers, she looks down and sees who it is that's calling on the caller ID. With me so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She puts the phone to her ear and she goes, hey, Howard, I'm so glad you just called me because I have had second thoughts and I'm just going to terminate my offer on your house. Do we have a contract or not? No. 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 Because Hilda terminated her offer before, before she was informed of the acceptance. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. 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 Right? So if you get the same scenario and you say, as soon as Hilda answered the phone, she goes, hello, Howard. I'm so glad you called me. And Howard goes, we're under contract. <laughs> <laughs> How that happens. <laughs> do, do we have a contract? Yes. 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 That is literally how the courts are going to sort it out. Who spoke first? Really? Yep. Uh, That's what it would come down to. Who notified who first? If Howard was the first to notify Hilda that her offer had been accepted, then we have a contract. If Hilda is the first to notify Howard that her offer has been rescinded, then we don't. Simple as that. What if Hilda answer, doesn't answer the phone? She's not home and he leaves a voicemail message. It's in, so that, What an interesting question. What if Hilda doesn't answer the phone? And she's not home and he leaves a voicemail message. We count communication as when it's sent, not when it's received. So the fact that he has communicated with her voicemail is good enough. <laughs> if he left her a voicemail message. So is this possible? Let's, let's just hypothetically play that out. Let's say Howard calls at three o'clock in the afternoon, doesn't get Hilda, but leaves a voicemail saying, Hilda, I'm so, I'm so excited to let you know I accepted your offer. Congratulations, we have a deal at three o'clock in the afternoon. Hilda's in an all-day meeting. Meanwhile, she's getting more and more nervous about this offer she made. Soon as the meeting busts out at five o'clock, she doesn't look at anything. She doesn't look at missed calls. She doesn't look at voicemail. She doesn't look at email. She immediately calls Howard to say, Howard, I just want to let you know, I'm going to terminate my offer. I'm too nervous about this. I can't do this. Do we have a contract? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Because what Howard's going to say is, um, you better go listen to your voicemail because I left you a message a couple of hours ago saying that your offer had been accepted. It's literally... It's not the first to hear the communication. It's the first to communicate. It's a race to communicate. Does that make sense for everybody now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This idea. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with them um, giving it to the agent. Well, we, so haven't, I, we haven't introduced agents yet. It's been, if you can first understand it, it's a great question, and we are going to introduce agency to this idea because agency will really matter. But you got to first understand it just from the standpoint, we got to do as simple as stripped down as possible, just the buyer and seller. And then we will insert the agents into the equation in, in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. So this, hopefully now this visual sort of makes sense to you that we don't have a contract until this wheel has turned full circle. Yeah. I mean, I think of it like, I know some of y'all grew up watching The Price is Right, right? I know some of you did, right? Mm -hmm. It don't count as a spin unless the wheel goes all the way around. Everybody knows that rule, right? If you spin the wheel and it don't go all the way around, it does not count. Same thing is true here when we're talking about forming a contract. Look at Grant with his background over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, so... At, by the way, I am an alum of The Price is Right. That is one of the other weird things about me. I was actually a contestant on The Price is Right one time. Did you win the big money? What? One time, long time ago. No, I never made it on stage. I was in contestants row. I was the last person to go up to contestants row. So I only got to bid one time and I did not make it up on stage. So, um, But uh, I bid on an armoire. I was 19 building on an armoire. I had no idea what an armoire <laughs> was, but what much less what one cost. So uh, <laughs> uh, it was a long time ago. 
It was a long time ago. Um, we were in LA for a, a football game. I, you know, I used to have it on VHS. I don't know where it is. I'm sure I could. VHS. Hey, oh God, yes. What is that? Oh, yes. Of course. Of oh course. my gosh. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're talking about like 1964 or something. Yeah. Like so that. Bob Barker was the still the guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it was Bob Barker with the super long microphone, microphone. having your pet spayed or neutered. Yeah, it was definitely Bob. And they were still called, <laughs> and they were still very uh, culturally insensitive and in calling them Barker's Beauties at the time still. Oh, God. You know, and Rod Roddy was the announcer, so I got to hear Rod Roddy say, come on down, you know, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> um, I, you know, I had a friend who named all his dogs after, after game show hosts. Oh, that's interesting. Wow. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's interesting. A lot of fun I can't facts. complain. Mine are all fruit. What, what's, what's that, Jordana? I said you guys have a lot of fun facts this afternoon. I know. It. We're, <laughs> we're full of something. I don't know what it is, but we're full of I it. tried to watch The Children of the Corn on VHA, the VHS this when I was the younger. This is random fact to what I've ever heard right here. Oh, yeah. And the 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 tape like started spinning out of the VHS, like all the film was like coming out of the VHS player. I was like, this is evil. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably true. That was a freaky movie. That was a freaky I, movie. I'm glad I didn't watch it. Um, well, at least it wasn't. What was that one that came out where you, you what with the ring? What was that? Is that the one where you watched the, the, the video? Mm -hmm. Remember Blair Witch Project? No, oh, I don't God. remember that. No, 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 I, I no. If I watch that now, I think it was the dumbest thing in the world. But we were mm -hmm. out of it when it first came out. We, we were yeah. the camera absolutely. shaking. <laughs> I hate it. Um, so when we talk about this, this wheel of the contract, it's got to spin all the way around. So if we start here with an offer or we don't have a contract until it's gone full circle and come back to them as a contract. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. It's not enough for the offeree to accept it. The offeree has to also communicate that acceptance back over to the offer or. And that's when we have a binding contract. When we've come full circle and made it all the way around and come back, the offeree signed it without making any changes. And then they communicated that acceptance and in any way they choose to, to us. Um, just a reminder, the offer itself and the contract itself must be in writing because this is an agreement covered by the statute of frauds. But the communication, the way we transmit the offers, the way we um, communicate with each other can really be any form of communication. Number one, let's talk about the signatures for a second. Do you think we can form digital documents, digital signatures in the modern world? Yes. Yes, yes absolutely. You know, when I first got into the business, and this shows you I am dating myself, we still required wet ink signatures on documents in North Carolina. Where everything had to be an actual sign. And you, I can remember like literally holding things up to the light to see if you could see the indentation from the pen because you had to make sure it was an actual signature, not a photocopy of a signature because we had to have original signatures on everything. And we, in the time I've been in the business, we've graduated from, oh, now you can use photocopies and you can use scans of signatures to now we don't even ever have to have a physical signature at all. We can simply have an electronic signature. That's all due to the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. Um, you just might see that referenced on the test. That's the law that allows for the electronic creation of these agreements. It's called the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. It's a federal law which allows for this. How about text message? Yes. Could, could we communicate yes. acceptance through text message? Yep. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I mean, we could communicate even offers through text messages, it's written communication, but it is, it's risky. I will say this, I'll say that. It's risky to use text messaging. I, I don't know about you, but you know, every once in a while I send a, a text and I look at what got sent and what I meant to say and what got sent are two entirely different. Have y'all ever had that experience? Yeah, yes. in oh, really yeah. Hard? So, you know, you have to be real careful with that when you're sending messages back and forth to people about forming contracts. I mean, you might find yourself in a situation like, you know, you know, that you don't want to 
find yourself in, um, you know, as an example, something like this. I love her. I love her. <laughs> but, so um, funny. She is. She is hilariously funny. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, here's my unscheduled break. I got to go run because they're knocking at the door. OK, so give me a couple minutes. Sorry about that. Seth, when you kind of walk out of a dream, you know, you walk through that white wall behind you. I know he does. He does. He just he just appears. He just appears. Exactly. He just appears. All right. So picking back up and I appreciate the patience there. The, the offer itself has to be definite. The terms of the offer have to be definite. And offers are take it or leave it. You there's no such thing as we accept your offer, but we want a different closing date. What, what is that? When somebody says we accept your offer, but we want a different closing date, what is that actually? Counter offer. It's a counter, counter, offer. It's, it's a counter, counter offer. offer. That's exactly right. Another question you may be asked about on the test is how do we present multiple offers? If we receive multiple offers, how do we present them? And the answer is always going to be, we present them in no particular order. We don't create preference. We work really hard not to create a preference for those offers. We're, we're, the goal here is to let the seller or whoever is considering the offer consider all offers without any sort of undue um, kind of pressure from us. We don't want to say things like, because here's the kind of things they might put on a test. You present the first offer that came in first. Well, that's not necessarily true. If you're dealing with the seller and you only have one offer, obviously that's the one you present first. But if you get four offers in an hour and then you're meeting with the seller, how are you going to present those four? Well, the answer is all four of them at the same time. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So whatever offers you have in hand whenever you're presenting offers, you are presenting all of them. This one right here is a huge note. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Huge note, all offers get presented, even if we're already under contract, even if we have accepted another offer, even if we're a day from closing and an offer comes in, no matter how they phrase that on a test, oh, the offer comes in on an outdated form. If the offer comes in on an outdated form, guess what you do? Present you, it. you present it. You present it. Now you might say to the, you know, to your client, oh, well, this comes in on an outdated form, and maybe we need to counter offer with a more up-to-date form, but you still present the offer. You even make sure to tell your client about the possibility of other offers just in case that might weigh into their decision making. If you're presenting an offer to a seller could it potentially impact their decision-making, for example, for you to say, well, you know, there's another buyer who looked this morning and they said they might make an offer. Could that potentially be impactful? Yes. yes. No doubt. No doubt. So, so make sure you present all offers and tell inform sellers of the presence of any potential offers. Does um, anybody present offers in person? They didn't rarely. get there. Okay. Rarely. I mean, it does happen from time to time. I think for most of us, it really depends on the, the seller that we're working with, you know, and mm -hmm. their preferences. You know, if you're dealing with somebody who's not tech savvy, who's not comfortable with, you know, looking at an offer online, some some people just are, you know, more comfortable with in person. And I think you have to judge that based on who you're dealing with. But yeah. do you ever do a fact sheet of each offer so that they don't have I do to like a summary sheet because yeah. it's overwhelming to give somebody a 15 page offer, especially if they have five offers. Yeah, it's hard you know, to if, they, if they got bunches of offers and each one of them is 15 or 20 pages, I'll usually do like a spreadsheet on Excel and say, OK, here's the purchase price offer. Number one, number two, number three, number four. Here's the the earnest money deposit. Number one, number two, number and just kind of line all the terms up side by side. So in one kind of reference point, they can because honestly, if they're all using the same standardized contract form and it's just fill in the blanks really all that matters is the blanks as far as comparing them because the language is going to be sa the same for all of them if they're all using the same form yeah um 
uh, counter offers do terminate any offer that came before and you restart the process. Obviously, counter offers can be hand handled orally, but they wouldn't be binding if they're handled orally. They're only binding if they're put into writing and signed, just like the contract itself, because counter offers would be covered under the statute of frauds. Um, as we mentioned earlier, listing agents must inform their sellers about all potential offers. We cannot accept or reject an offer on behalf of our clients in most circumstances, because we are what kind of agents mostly when we're working in sales? Special agents. Special, special agents. agents. We are good. Uh, we are special agents most of the time in sales transactions, which means we do not have the authority to accept or reject an offer. Could we be given that authority though? Could they give us like a limited form of general agency that would allow us to accept yes. an offer on their yes. behalf? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that would usually be called like a limited power of attorney, you know, mm -hmm. is how we would use, but it's general agency. Like don't bring me anything under 800,000. That's right. Or if you get anything above 800,000, you have my permission to accept it. They could give us that authority. You know, they could sign a listing agreement that says anything above 800,000, you have my permission to accept it. You don't even have to present it to me. That would be an example of general agency. And I have mm -hmm. had that. I had, so I had one seller one time, uh, and this has been about three years ago, and they were going on an around the world cruise right after we listed the property. They didn't want to list it until they left for the cruise. They wanted it listed while they were on the cruise. Well, you think about being on an around the world cruise, they're not going to have a lot of communication, you know, being on a cruise liner around the world. And it was like an 80 day cruise. And so basically we, we sat down and we came to like, okay, here's the list price. But if you get offers in excess of this, you have our permission to accept it. So we listed it at 500. And they and they did they wanted the ability to think about offers, but I, I said to them, I said, well, is there any number at which you would just say accept it and we don't even need to hear about it? And they said, if you got 550, we don't even need to hear about it. If you get 550 and they're qualified and they, you know, can do a conventional loan, I said, well, let's put all that in the right. And they did. And we got four offers, and none of them were at 550. And so I told all four of the, the buyers. We, you know, we have multiple offers. I will present them to the seller when they're available, you know, on their cruise. I'm not sure what day that'll be, but as soon as they are, I'll let you know. And um, the one of the buyers said, well, why do we have to wait so long? I said, well, bluntly, um, there is a number at which they have said, I'm free to accept the offer on their behalf. I'm not free to disclose that number. But I, there is a number at which I'm free to accept it on their behalf, but we don't have, you know, your offer doesn't meet that point. That's all I can tell you. And so I have to present your offer to them. And I gave that information to all four of the buyers. And one of those buyers came back and said, well, you know what? We want to change our offer. We want to offer 875. And they were just taking a shot in the dark that that would be above the number that the sellers had. Was it above the number? Yeah. So guess what I did? Accept. Accepted because I had that authority. I've been specifically given that authority. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. And yes. So when I finally did talk to the sellers, I said, congratulations, you're under contract <laughs> <laughs> for 875. And they were thrilled. And they were thrilled. Okay. Counter offers. Any change is counter offer. It also changes the roles. Offer or becomes offer E. The original offer is gone. It was obliterated by the counter offer itself. I think everybody's probably okay with that now. So how do offers get terminated? Well, offers can be terminated in a number of ways. If the offeree rejects the offer or they create a counter offer, both of those would terminate the offer. Any time limit that the offer or has placed on it, it is very possible. You might see this on a test, but it certainly happens in the real world. Could an offer or, like a buyer, for example, say my offer is valid until Saturday at 6 p.m.? Yes. Yes. And if the offer hasn't been acted on by Saturday at 6 p.m., it would automatically terminate. 
at that point in time. That's the advantage of placing a time limit on an offer. In North Carolina, do they put upon presentation? What's that? No, I don't know what that means. Oh, so in California, the, in order to keep the seller from shopping the offer, they would say that they have to respond when it's presented, yes or no. Ah, and no, they, well, could, they couldn't take all that time because the market was so hot. Yeah, I've never seen anything like that, but we certainly see people that'll submit offers, you know, it, like today and say you, the offer's good until noon on Saturday. So they would give a very, you know, sort of limited window to respond for, you know, because of that. Um, so time limits. Be be cautious of time limits. So let me point this out to you. They love to trap you on the test with time limits. Let me give you a hypothetical situation to see how you would respond on the test. Michael has placed an offer on a property and said his offer is valid until Sunday at 6 p.m. On mm -hmm. Saturday at noon, he decides to rescind his offer. Can he do so? Yes. Yes. Yeah. He absolutely can. He can rescind his offer at any time, folks. The expiration is if he hasn't heard back, it automatically terminates itself. He can still terminate his offer at any point he wants to. Does that make sense? He's not making a promise that saying his offer will definitely stay valid until Sunday at 6 p.m. He's saying, if I haven't heard back from you by Sunday, 6 p.m., my offer is terminated, but I still reserve the right to terminate my offer anytime before that. Is that a, is everybody okay with, with the, what we just went through there? Mm -hmm. That that offer yes. or can terminate their offer anytime they want to. They don't have to, they don't have to honor their own time limit, in other words. Um, uh, withdrawal of the offer prior to acceptance, which is what we just talked about, and then this one, this is a huge one for test taking purposes. If we are still in the offer stage, if we have not yet formed a contract, death of either party. So who are the two parties to this offer? Offer, offer, buyer, seller, correct? Mm -hmm. right. right, buyer and seller. If either of them dies while this is still an offer, the offer is dead as well. Buyer submits an offer, seller drops dead. There is no more offer. Buyer submits an offer, buyer drops dead. There is no more offer. Is everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. Yep. But, and I cannot stress this enough, look at the asterisks here. It says, however, death would not terminate a what? Contract. contract. A contract. The rules change once we go under contract. If it's still an offer, death knocks it dead. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But once it's a contract, you are still under contract, even if you're what? Dead. 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 Even if you're dead. Well, now, does the firm, what happens if the client, I mean, if the realtor dies? No, uh, the nothing. Happens, if so. the individual agent dies, absolutely nothing because the list the agreement, buyer agency the agreement was with the firm. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So the, the sales contract would survive. So just as an example, let's say that, you know, as an example, Summer goes under contract to purchase a property. She's the buyer and she's purchasing the property from Philip. Before we get to closing, Philip is killed in a car accident. Mm -hmm. Do we still have a contract? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. We're under contract. Oh, you said under contract. We're under contract. Summer and Philip are under contract. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and before we get to closing, Philip is killed in a car accident. Are we still mm -hmm. under contract? You, you have yes. the we are. And what? here's what that means. It means that, I don't know why I hear noise. Um, um, it means that when Philip dies, his heirs have to follow through with the intent he had when he signed that contract. 
whether whether he whether his heirs want to or not could his heirs have a different view of selling the property could they all of a sudden be sentimental about dad's property that he was going to sell yes or want it themselves or, or want it themselves maybe they never wanted him to sell they don't have that choice because that contract survives mm -hmm. death but now if philip was killed before he had accepted the offer what would happen to the offer it would be dead. It would be yeah, dead. And it would be terminated. Does everybody see the difference there? Travis, yeah. would this make the... Uh-oh, I lost you, Taj. I got with this mate. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, would that make it voidable um, for the contract if he died while under contract? No, the contract, contract would still be valid. A, a sales contract would still be valid with the death of either party. A contract does not change at all if one of the parties dies. An offer dies if one of the parties dies. Remember, these are not the same things. An offer exists before a contract. An offer has only been signed by how many sides to the agreement? How many sides have signed an offer? Just one. one. Just one, one, right? We still don't have acceptance of the offer. Mm -hmm. If we're just at the offer stage where it's only been signed by one, either of the parties dies. It doesn't matter if it's the one who signed the offer or the other one. Either of the parties dies while it's an offer, offer goes away. There is no more offer, okay? But once we have communication of acceptance, once we are under contract, death does not change that sales contract at all. Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead, Aaron. To, to say you um, said that didn't happen and someone died, would you have to wait like for the will to be read to see who would be the executor to, to sign the contract? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like to, well, how would that work? No, because what happens there is as soon as the person dies, now, most likely a court would say that the the seller was entitled to a reasonable delay while they sorted out who would who would be the executor of the estate. But that might that delay might be a month max. Uh -huh. And so what the court would say is you got to hurry up and figure out who the executor is because they got to sell this property. OK, that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. yep, it would it would it would go pretty quickly and it would stay as it would stay a contract, even from the buyer side, even if we flipped it around and summer was the one who died as the buyer. Would her heirs still be under contract to purchase that property? Yes. Yes. They would be. They would be. Pardon me. May I, is this like nationally recognized? Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. That's contract law for sales contracts. Sales contract. So, and that's what's interesting. Offers are super fragile. An offer falls apart. And like you just whisper at it the wrong way and the offer goes away. But once it becomes a contract, it, almost nothing will end it. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, even death, even death. But now something happening to the property would end it. Something happening to the property would make the contract voidable. We will talk about that. Once a contract is formed, something happened to the, con to the property would make the contract voidable, not gone, not terminated, not over, but voidable. Which part do you think it would be voidable for? If the contract was destroyed, let's say Summer is under contract to buy the, ha the house from Philip and tornado comes through and blows the house down, which party would still be bound and which one would now have the option of either moving forward or walking away? Buyer has the option. Buy Philip bound, buyer has the option. Does that make sense? So Philip, would, the seller would be bound, Summer would have a voidable contract. She could walk away. You know what would happen in that case? Interestingly enough, somebody brought up the idea of the property being damaged. So here's what Summer's choice would actually be. Do I walk away, get out and get all my money back because the property has been damaged? It's not the same thing I agreed to purchase. That's option number one for Summer. Everybody good on that option? Mm -hmm. Here's option number two, purchase the property. But here's the kicker that you're not expecting. Is the property likely insured? Yes. By who? By the, the seller. seller. By the seller, <laughs> Philip. Guess who would be entitled to the insurance proceeds? Ooh, the Summer. 
the buyer. That would be Summer's Choice. Summer's Choice would either be, and that's why we say it's still the buyer's choice because she's actually entitled to the insurance proceeds if she goes through with the sale. Because So here's her choice. Either terminate the contract and get all my money back or take whatever insurance settlement is coming from Phillips Insurance Company, buy the house and be entitled to those insurance proceeds. Could that be a could that end up being an actual win for summer in that case? Yeah. Yes. yes. And that's yeah. exactly how it would work in that situation. Exactly. Is it hard to get property insured if they've had a claim like that? Well, it depends on what the claim is. If it's okay. a total loss claim, it might be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it would be up to summer. And summer might decide, like, what I mean, think about it. What because I've seen this happen in real estate transactions. Stranger things have happened, right? I've seen buyers come in offering to buy a house and they're sitting there thinking, I'm going to have to gut the kitchen. I'm going to have to gut the bathrooms. I'm like, you know, it's just, I'm not, and they've already worked that into their offer. Is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. And then a pipe bust two weeks before, two weeks before closing completely floods the inside of the house. Well, guess what the buyer was planning to do anyway after they bought the house, folks? Forget it. They were planning to gut it themselves. Now they're going to get the house at the same price they agreed to pay anyway and an insurance check for all the damage from the seller's insurance. Summer is going to laugh all the way to the bank. She might have been the one that bust the pipe. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> she would never do that. She would never do that. Are we all good on this idea of death and what it would what impact it would have on a contract or not have rather? Okay, good, good, good deal. Um, we talked about how to handle multiple offers. This is a going to be a test question, and this is a big deal in North Carolina. This is North Carolina specific, but it will be tested this way on the national section because this is the more common way as well. That's why I don't have a North Carolina flag here, but this is a big deal in North Carolina. This is a big one for our real estate commission in particular. We are forbidden from a process called shopping offers. Elizabeth mentioned that phrase earlier. Shopping offers is the process of telling one buyer what another buyer is willing to pay for the property. So you have to remember the seller and the seller's agents, the listing agents, are going to see all of the offers, right? I mean, if there's 15 offers, how many offers is the listing agent going to see? All 15. All 15. So they know, do all 15 buyers, though, see all the offers? Or do the buyers only see their own offer? They only see their own offer. They only see their own offer. And that's all they're allowed to know about. No buyer can know the terms of another buyer's offer. Even if your client, the seller, explicitly tells you, if Grant calls me and says, Travis, I want you to call these other 14 buyers up and tell them we have a higher offer. Are there sellers, by the way, who are going to ask you to do that? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Of course they are, because they want because they know if we call those other 14 buyers and say, hey, we have a higher offer, what's that's probably going to incentivize at least some of those buyers to do? More. Come back with more. Come back with more. Folks, that is officially an auction at that point, and you don't have an auctioneer's license. Okay. That, that is not allowed in North Carolina. So how's that going to be asked on the test? The way they're going to ask it is they're going to say something like, Grant, the seller, has received two offers on his property, one from Claudia and one from Jordana, okay? One from Claudia, one from Jordana. Claudia's offer is slightly better than Jordana's, and Grant wants his listing agent, Travis, to contact Jordana and inform her that we have a higher offer. Here's the answer they're looking for on the test. Mm -hmm. It cannot happen unless we get whose permission. Whose permission do we need Jordana. to disclose? Oh, Jordana. Jordana. 
what Jordana, is the offer no, to share? Jordana's. It's Jordana we're giving the information to. Whose offer are we disclosing? Oh, Do we have to get permission Mine. from both, buyer well, and seller? Well, yeah, we, you, permission from both, but you're not catching my drift I here. have to be permission. To it's got to be Claudia's permission. permission. It's her mm -hmm. offer that we're giving away to the other buyer, right? It, Jordana's permission doesn't matter. Grant's permission doesn't matter. It's Claudia who's going to be harmed by us giving her offer away. So in order to give Jordana the information that we have a higher offer, we need permission from the person who made that higher offer. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. And here's the thing. From a practical standpoint, here's what that conversation sounds like. Hey, Claudia, this is Travis. Listen, thank you so much for your offer. Here's the deal. Um, the seller would like us to contact another buyer and let them know that you have made a higher offer. Is that okay with you, Claudia? Are you good with that? What's her answer going to be? It should be no. No, no. of course no. not. It's not. Nobody in their right mind is ever going to give that permission because they know why they'd be, I mean, they know what you'd be doing with the information, Right. And, but the, te the, the answer they're going to be looking for is you can't do that without the permission of the buyer whose information you're disclosing. Are we all good with that? Yep. Okay, good. Exactly. Seth said, please do, and I sue. And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, we talked about acceptance. Acceptance is an all or nothing thing. You either accept or reject. I mean, that, those are the choices for the offeree. And signing without any changes is considered acceptance. Reminder here, we're not under contract until we have communication of acceptance. What that means is that the offeree signing without making any changes is not quite enough. We need to go that one step further. What's that next step? Well, the offeree's got to communicate back to the offer or that we are under contract. And why is that important? It's important because at that point, there's no going back. At that point, we have a valid, binding, enforceable agreement. And the parties owe each other stuff. They owe each other those promises. And that's the point at which people can start getting sued if they don't follow through with their promises. Does that make sense for everybody that this is the point of, you know, of no return as far as a contract goes. At this point, somebody not doing what they promised is called a breach from this point forward, once we have communication of acceptance. So all those promises start rolling the minute we have communication of acceptance. Communicating acceptance is something you're going to have to identify on the test. You're going to have to really read carefully on these test questions to identify communication of acceptance and when we have communication of acceptance, because that is the moment of contract formation. Now, remember the contract itself has to be in writing. The acceptance is signing, so that has to be in writing, but the communication can be in any format. Can communication be verbal? Yes. Yes, we've accepted your offer. Can communication be a text that says the sellers accepted your offer? Yes. 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 Can communication be an email that says the buyer has accepted the seller's counter offer? Yep. Yes. Yes. That's all communication of acceptance. Everybody good with that so far? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That all counts as communication of acceptance. So that can be in any format possible. And now we're going to start to bring the question that Henley asked earlier into the picture. What if we bring agents into the picture? What if we, because really, if you think about it, isn't communicating anything in the transaction likely to flow through us as the agents of these people? Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, does that change things? If you communicate acceptance to the seller's agent, is that the same thing as communicating acceptance to the seller themselves? What do y'all think the answer is? Yes. 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 That agent is the legal representative of that seller, folks. 
when you're speaking to them legally, that's the same thing as speaking to the seller. So if Seth is functioning as a buyer's agent in a transaction, and we send him a text message saying your buyer's offer has been accepted, is the buyer under contract? Yes. 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 Instantly. Instantly. And by the way, does Seth even have to read the text for the buyer to be under contract? No. What do y'all think? No. No. It just no. Have to send no. It. And just that's, send it. that's where this rule comes into play. This is a very old rule, but that is still practiced today called the mailbox rule. The mailbox rule says that when you're sending communication of acceptance, it doesn't matter when the communication is received or read. It matters when it's sent. So let's say that TT is the seller's agent, Seth is the buyer's agent. TT sends Seth an email saying, congratulations, the sellers have accepted your buyer's offer. Seth doesn't read the email until tomorrow morning because he's burned out on email or because he got kicked out for spamming too many people. Pick your poison. We okay. should not bring that up. We should not bring that up. <laughs> it was not a good morning. Uh, I, I was like, he's, like, he's like, did you lock me out of my email? No. No. I was pissed. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's say TT is, again, the seller's agent and Seth is the buyer's agent. And, and TT sends us an email, that, but Seth doesn't see it till tomorrow. When was the buyer and seller under contract? When TT sent the email today or when Seth reads the email tomorrow? When TT sends it. TT sends it today. So here's the interesting thing. Seth hasn't read the email, so surely the buyer has no idea they're under contract, correct? But they, correct. Still, but they still are. They are legally under contract. It's all about when the communication is sent. Now, why do we call this the mailbox rule? Because it was actually written for postal mail. It was written for old-fashioned snail mail. Think about how crazy that would be. Don't do this, by the way, but it is still the law. Don't sign a contract and then communicate it by dropping that contract in the mail back to the other side. That's not a good idea. Here's the problem. How long does it take the mail to show up on the other side? Three to five days. Days, right? When are we actually under contract, though? When it was when you put it in the mailbox. When, when the offer... E dropped it in the mailbox back to the offer or does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. So now you've got yeah. this offer or running around for three, four, five, six, seven days under contract with no idea that they're under contract. That's not a good dynamic. Okay. I, I would not recommend that. Here's what I would recommend. No matter what's going on, if your client accepts an offer, what are you going to immediately do? Call the buyer, call your seller. You're going to communicate to the other side. Yeah. You're going to communicate with the other side of the transaction, whether that is send a text message, send an email, make a phone call, send a Snapchat, Facebook message. I don't care. I don't care what you send, but send something saying your offer has been accepted. Are we all good with that statement? If yes. I may, I just want to, you know, remind everybody just what I put in there in the chat put it there um, <laughs> because I don't know if we touched base on this or not Travis acceptance is signing that's when the offer e has signed the contract without making a single change acceptance means signed Correct. but communication of acceptance is when that signing has been communicated to the um, offer or exactly exactly very big difference so I think of it almost like voting. I think voting is a good analogy for this. When you go into the, if you, if you go vote in person, which hopefully everybody votes, right? But if you go vote in person, you go into the, into the little booth, you fill out your ballot, you voted, correct? Correct. But has your vote counted until you put it into the slot in the machine, until you communicate, this is my vote, you no. haven't been counted. Does that make yep. sense for everybody? Yep. Yes. Yep. So, so think of the contract formation process in the same way. 
if the offeree signs the offer, they've accepted, but it doesn't matter because they haven't communicated that acceptance. They have to go, they're, they're, they're so close, but so far away. They've got to communicate that acceptance back to the offeror somehow. And just touching base on that. So if you see a uh, word problem that says that the offer E has signed, do we have a contract? No. No. Right. And they're going to, oh, they're going to take you on this long they trail. They will. It's like a trail <laughs> of tears for sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's so really important. If the offeree um, signs it, but I haven't communicated it yet to the other side, but another offer hits my email, can I tell the seller we have another offer. Do you want me to communicate this so we're in contract or do you want me to bring you the other offer first? I love this question. <laughs> I love this question. This You're is a welcome. perfect question. There, I'm going to restate the question because everybody needs to cue on, on how good of a question this is. Elizabeth said, what if the, 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 off, the seller, offeree, receives an offer, signs it without making any changes, gives it back to their agent, not to the agent on the other side, their agent mm -hmm. and says, okay, here's the, here's, here's the contract. I just signed it. And their agent goes, I just got off the phone. We got another offer. Can the seller still take back the fact that they've signed offer number one and accept offer number two if they feel offer number two is better at that point in time. Can they do it, yes. folks? Yes. No. Yes. They actually it can. Yes. Because they have not communicated acceptance to the other side. They've only accepted it, which means they've only signed it, and it hasn't been communicated, so we don't have a contract. And, but here's the key. you And you, they're going to do this to you on the test them giving their own agent is not communication folks if they're telling their own agent they've signed it they're talking to themselves communication of acceptance goes to the other what the other side the other side, the other side. does everybody see why that seller can still back out they're not under contract at that point in time yes yeah. now what what if they if they presented the uh, if they did communicate it to the other side and that same offer came in. Then they're under contract. You know, too bad, so sad. If they've communicated acceptance, if Seth had already called the other agent on the other side or the buyer on the other side, whoever's on the, anybody on the other side and said, the seller just accepted your offer. I don't care if the offer comes in for $33 million above list price, you're already under contract. Yeah. But you still have to present that offer to the seller. You do have to present that offer to the seller, which is going to make it very hard for them not to want to breach the first contract and try to accept the second one. But, that, you know, that. but you have to present it to them. But they are not legally able to accept it because they're already under contract. That's a really, really great practical. How many of y'all, by the way, think that happens in this crazy market right now? With, with offers flying in left, right, and center, and everybody's trying to outbid each other. How many of you think sellers are signing offers right now, and before we can even communicate back to the other side that that offer has been accepted, we get another offer in that's even higher than that one? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why it's like, you know, a good thing. Like if you're representing a client, the best thing you can do for that client is hold that offer and just go ahead and submit. I mean, not submit, but let them know another offer has came in. Right. If you're working in your client's best interest. Well, well right. If, if, if you're the agent and you get the offer in and they just, and your client just gave you the, the accepted contract, you need to hold off on communicating acceptance. You need to, you know, put a pause on things and say, okay, I'm going to, we're going to go over this offer first because I want to be sure that you are absolutely 100% sure you still want me to let these first people know they're under contract before you've reviewed this one. And so that you would be doing the right thing by pausing before you communicated acceptance there. So what is a pause? How long? A day? Two well, days? That's a, I mean, that's a, that, that's you as an individual agent broker are going to have to make that decision uh, in conjunction with your client. You would, but, I would tell them or ask them, hey, as Seth just said, 
do you want me to go ahead and communicate to this buyer number one that you're under contract or do you want to consider this offer that just came in tell me what you want to do because it's too late once i've called this buyer and told them we're under contract most Unless sellers would, we're beyond their time limit right if you went beyond uh, their time limit then their first offer is gone and you right. you're, you're and so we'd have to be conscious of that too but assuming we're going to be within time limits and all those kinds of things the seller might say, okay, well, hold on. Let me, let's take a look at this second offer and see, maybe I want to accept that one. And so, you know, it's different for everybody, but in my mind, I have OCD. So I'm like, well, you know, thinking, okay, I got to get this done in like two to three hours. I, here's the way I view that. That shouldn't even seem chaotic from the other side because should either of those buyers be aware that that's happening on the other side? No. That's that, that all that chaos is happening on one side of the transaction. That that buyer number one does not know that their offer has been accepted. So it's not like they're going to be crushed to find out that you know their offer was accepted and they didn't go under contract. You're never going to tell them. If if the seller ends up deciding on offer number two, you're just going to communicate acceptance to offer number two. Yes, because you know, you know, you have that signed contract, you're the agent, your client gave it to you, and then another offer comes in at that moment. If you go ahead and communicate to buyer number one that the uh, offer has been accepted, but your seller really liked buyer number two instead, they might be at a potential to breach. Well, well, they're in, well first of all, they're mad at you because you put yes. them on your contract when they were still considering an offer. So everybody with us on that? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's communication with anybody in the firm, right? Not just your... Anybody on the whole side of the transaction. So right. yes, that would include anybody on that in that firm, The anybody, like if you're talking about on the buyer's side, buyer, buy, you know, buyer's agent, the broker in charge on the buyer's side, mm -hmm. the, the receptionist at the desk at the buyer's firm, the, you know, anybody on that team. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's exactly right. So look at, look at this example right here. We're going to go through several of these examples to kind of test you on this. It says a buyer signs an offer to purchase a property for $200,000. The buyer's agent emails the offer to the listing agent. The listing agent emails the offer to the seller and the seller accepts it without change. The seller sends a copy to the listing agent. The listing agent emails the buyer's agent. You know what? Here's the thing. This is too much. Let me show you what you're going to have to do when you get to these questions. Hmm. It ain't that hard. How many sides are there to this transaction, folks? Two. 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 And isn't there like a dividing line between them? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right? All we need to do is draw lines that coincide with what's going on here. It says a buyer signs an offer to purchase a property for $200,000. The buyer's agent. So should we just go ahead and put buyer's agent over here? Are they on the buyer's side? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. It says the buyer's agent emails an offer to the listing agent. So is it fair then to draw an arrow, excuse me, from that side now yep. to the listing agent? Everybody good with me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So there's our offer. It says the seller accepts it without change. Okay. The seller sends the copy to the listing agent. All right. You can draw that arrow in there if you want to. Is that communication of acceptance, folks? Yes. No. No. It yeah, has not gone to the other, to side. The other side. It you doesn't know? matter that they're communicating. They're talking to <clears throat> themselves. Oh, judge, judge. Communication of acceptance has to go to the other side. The seller sending it to the listing agent is absolutely nothing. Does that make sense for everybody now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, it says the seller accepts it without change. The seller sends a copy to the listing agent. The listing agent emails the buyer's agent to update them on the status. Fair enough. Yeah. And then the then the buyer's agent calls the buyer. First question: Has a legally binding contract been formed here? What do y'all think? Yes. 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 When, yes. when? When they send the email. Mm -hmm. Yep. When the seller send an email back to the buyer. Mm -hmm. When listing agent sends email to update it. 
right there. That moment right there. Because that's when the communication of acceptance went from one side to mm -hmm. the other side. Does everybody see why that's so important right there? Mm -hmm. Yes. All the other communication, buyer talking to buyer's agent, does that mean anything? Nope. No. Oh. Seller talking to the listing agent, does that mean anything? Oh, no. 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 Whenever you're doing this, communicating with your own agent means absolutely nothing. But communicating with somebody on the other side means everything. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So, yes, we have a valid contract and that is formed when listing agent emails buyer agent. So, talk to me. Anybody not okay with those two answers to that question right there? Yeah. And so here's what that looks like as sort of a diagram, because some of you, it might help to see it visually. OK, so you've got your buyer over here represented by ABC Realty. You got your seller over here represented by XYZ Realty. The buyer makes an offer. The seller accepts it. And then the, the, a, the agent communicates back to the other agent. Do we have a contract? Yes. Yeah. Two arrows going both directions. We have a contract, folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a contract. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's look at let's look at another one. A buyer and seller agreed to dual agency representation. The agent writes an offer. Sorry for the typo. Let's fix that. The, right, the agent writes an offer at the discretion of the buyer, and the buyer signs it promising to pay $250,000 for the property. The agent emails the offer to the seller. The seller unconditionally accepts the offer and emails a signed copy to the agent. The, the uh, agent, that should say agent, that's another typo. Wow, I must have been drunk when I wrote that. The agent calls the buyer to update them. It really doesn't matter anyway. That sentence is useless, just FYI. So first question, has a contract been formed? What do y'all think? Yes. 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 So if I was doing this one, if I was doing my buyer seller here, here's what I would say. I got buyer on this side, seller on this side. There's the line between them, correct? Mm-hmm. Where is the agent, folks? Or which side are they on? Seller. Each side, each agent. Oh, they're oh, they're they're, oh. they're both under the seller. seller. It's a both. dual agency. Both sides. They're on both sides. Isn't the agent on both sides? Both yeah. sides. Yeah. Yes. So would it be fair to say then that the agent crosses the boundary between these two? Let me do a different color sheet. Yeah. Isn't the agent right there in the middle because they're on both sides of the transaction? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So now let's map this out. Buyer and seller agree to dual agency representation. The agent, the agent writes an offer at the direction of the buyer and the buyer signs it promising to pay $250,000 for the property. So the buyer makes an offer and gives it to the agent, right? Uh-huh. The agent gives it to the seller. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The seller unconditionally accepts the offer and emails a signed copy back to the agent. Everybody will go with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And oops, sorry, let me go back. And it says the agent calls the buyer to update. And why does it keep doing that? Stop doing that. The question is, do we have a contract? What do y'all yeah, think? Do we have to go in directions? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so we the full, full circle. We agree. We definitely have a contract. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go to now, the book. Here's the big question that you're gonna have to be able to answer on the test. Green line or purple line? Which one made the contract? When did purple it become line. a contract? Purple line. Green, Green line. 
Green line. Green. Green line. Oh, look, that green line. When the seller, I mean, when the agent, the agent, it's the same as communicating. Because no, agent. the agent is on which team, folks? Both, both. 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 both teams. So both. if the seller both. sent that signed contract back to the agent, were they sending it to the buyer's agent? Yeah, yes. yes. they were. And so the green line, it was sent, it became a contract when seller sends to agent. Yeah. But there is no purple line. Am I clear? Somebody was talking about a purple line. There is a purple line. It's hard to see. It's the one from the agent to the buyer. Oh, I see it. Purple rain. Is that better? See that one now. All right. Does everybody, does everybody see why it's the green line that is when the is when the contract is formed here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in this case, because it's dual agency, the agent is on both sides. Everybody all right with that? Yes. So agency rears its ugly head again. You thought you were done with agency. There it is again. Because would this be a different answer if this had not been a dual agent? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Let, let's say that this agent was a seller sub agent or just a listing yes. agent. When which line would be the contract if the agent was not on both sides? If they were just on the seller side, which line would it be? The purple one. It the would purple. be the purple one. It'd yeah, be the purple. purple one. Does that make oh, sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Purple mm -hmm. blue, yeah. Yep. And would we treat designated dual agency the same as if they were in two separate firms? That's exactly right. Designated dual agency. So with designated dual agency, what you're looking at is one bubble to the other bubble. You know, you're looking at this buyer's bubble to the seller's bubble with designated dual agency. Okay. So that's what this one looks like as a diagram. Because everybody in the firm is sitting here in the middle ground, when you take that offer from the buyer over to the seller and then the seller signs it and sends it back to the firm, well, when you're sending it back to the seller's firm, you're also sending it to the buyer because they're also the buyer's firm. Does that make sense for everybody? That's why dual agency changes that answer so significantly. It's really confusing, that dual agency. It is. It is. Okay. Look at this one right here. It says a buyer who is represented by Samantha of ABC Realty as a designated agent. Here comes Grant's question. Signs an offer to purchase a property. So if, we, if we're doing designated agency, can we just go ahead and draw a couple bubbles here? Do we know that we're going to have that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's my buyer bubble. I'm going to put buyer over here. And we're going to do the seller bubble over this way. Okay, so the buyer who's represented by Samantha of ABC Realty. So let me go ahead and fill that in as well. We got Samantha, ABC, okay, as a designated agent, signs an offer to purchase, which, by the way, don't I already know what the firm's going to be on the other side? If it's designated it's agency, ABC. what's the it's firm going to be? It's still going to be ABC, right? But it's going to be a different agent of ABC. Does that make sense for everybody? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it says the designated buyer's agent um, emails the offer to the listing agent, Larry. So there's Larry. So buyer agent emails the offer to listing agent, Larry of ABC. Larry delivers the offer to the seller who accepts it without condition and texts Larry to inform him of doing so. We'll do that one in yellow. So the seller signs it and texts Larry. There's that right there. Our, first of all, are we accepted? Has the seller accepted? No. No. no it's on the same Yes, they have, no. folks. See, this is where you're not following the definitions. What's acceptance? I didn't ask if we were under contract. Uh, I ask yes, if the yes. seller has accepted. Have they signed it? Yes. 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 Acceptance is not the same thing as communication of acceptance. Have we had communication of acceptance? No, not yet. No, no we have not. 
So Larry, it, it, so Larry has, it says Larry delivers the offer to the seller who accepts it without condition and texts Larry to inform him of doing so. That's our yellow line. Larry leaves Samantha a voicemail. So Larry leaves Samantha a voicemail. Informing her of the seller's acceptance. Two days later, boy, Samantha's slow. Two <laughs> days later, it says here, Samantha informs the buyer of the happy news. So talk to me. Yellow line, blue line, burgundy line, or not a contract at all? Which one is it? Blue line. Contract. Blue line, the voicemail. Yeah, contract. Yes, yes a contract. And uh, somebody I want to receive the, is the voicemail, just when they... Blue, blue line. line. Voicemail. Does that make sense for everybody? Because as Grant said earlier, when designated dual agents, you don't we just treat them like it's two separate firms? Mm-hmm. That's exactly what we do. Okay. And there's a diagram with what we've actually done is pulled the agents out and put them on each side. Of course, everybody else in the middle. What is what are all the rest of these people? The, the remaining agents of the firm. What kind of agency do they have? Are they dual designated agents dual agents or are they just dual agents? They're sub agents of the seller. Mm -mm. Oh, it just who does who does the firm work for? The seller. The firm. Yeah. Not just the seller. Both. The seller also the works for the buyer, right? In this case, isn't mm -hmm. a, isn't ABC Realty the agent of both people? Yeah, it's yeah. Cool. Yes. So, what is everybody else that's in ABC Realty other than Larry and Samantha here? They're dual agents. They're agents. dual agents. So you got Larry over here as a designated seller's agent. You got Samantha over here as a designated buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. And everybody else is just a dual agent in the transaction. Mm -hmm. So if the seller so listing agent called the firm and the person on floor duty answered the phone, she could say, they could say, I'm just calling to let you know that we have accepted the offer on 123 Main Street. And that Good. And that, and that would create a contract. You're not going to get one that complex, though. Okay. Yes. If well, you let. Except real life. It, it, well, right, except in real life. If you let anybody in this box know, you've communicated to both sides because the people in that box are still on both sides. But if you let these people know, they're in the bubbles. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. That's designated agency. Mm -hmm. And another one. We got 73 of these to finish today, by the way. Um, oh, um, wonderful. Uh, <laughs> An unrepresented, like buyer, uh -huh. an, an unrepresented buyer asked an agent with ABC Realty to write up an offer on a property listed with XYZ Realty. Okay, so let's look at this thing. We got buyer, we got seller, we got the division between them. Okay, it says an unrepresented buyer. I'm just going to put an asterisk beside them because they are by themselves. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. they, they got nobody ask an agent with abc realty to write up an offer on a property listed with xyz realty the buyer refuses representation in the transaction stop stop wow. right there how many firms are involved in this transaction folks one Oh, really? Y'all better check again. Oh, no, there's two. 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 I see I see ABC and XYZ. I see two. Yeah. two. Don't we have to put both of them on A side in the transaction? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's no such there's no such thing as being uninvolved, right? They have to be yes. on A side, correct? <laughs> yes. Yes. It has told you twice. How stubborn are we going to be? Are we going to listen to what they're telling us? <laughs> they're saying here, literally, an unrepresented buyer. The buyer refuses representation in the transaction. Which side is ABC Realty on, folks? Seller. Seller. The buyer. Which, which yes. side is um, XYZ Realty on? The seller. Mm-hmm. And you know that because they told you not once, but what? Twice. Twice. 
that there's no representation. But so there's no to be agency. Hard headed and insist on forcing representation on this buyer. <laughs> no. Can there be two firms, but both of them working for the seller? Yes. 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 And folks, they don't have to tell you that they both work for the seller for you to know they both work for the seller. Here's two facts. Number one, fact number one, if a firm is involved in the transaction, they have to work for one of these two parties. Does that, is that, a, is, would it, can everybody agree with that? Yes. Fact number two, the buyer said, screw all of you. I don't want representation. Combine those two facts and both firms must represent who? The seller. The seller. And you got to learn to recognize that, by the way, how big is agency looming all again, all of a sudden? Big. Again? big. You can't answer contract yeah. questions without agency, right? So it says XYZ has agreed that they will cooperate with outside firms as either buyer's agents or as sub-agents of the seller. Well, we know which one they are in this case. They're sub-agents of the seller. It says the ABC Realty agent writes the offer and emails it to the listing agent. So here's what we got. ABC is emailing to XYZ. Everybody good with that? Yeah. It says the ABC agent writes the offer and emails it to the listing agent. And it says XYZ is the listing company. Okay. So ABC is emailing to XYZ. The listing agent delivers the offer to the seller in person. I'll change colors. You know, it's a trend here, right? Uh, this communication is awfully daggum one-sided, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, we know the offer came from the buyer. The original offer came from the buyer to ABC. But now it's just pinging around on the other side. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It says the seller signs and accepts the offer without change and faxes it back to the XYZ listing agent, a fax machine. Where did they find one of those? You're dating yourself again. So now we- Did I say that? Again, communication all on one side. It says the XYZ agent leaves a voicemail with the ABC real estate agent. I need another color. So XYZ is leaving a voicemail for ABC. The ABC Realty agent subsequently calls the buyer to inform them of the contract's acceptance. Has a contract been formed, folks? Yes. 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 Finally. Yes. Purple line. Purple. Yes. Which line? Purple. Purple. Line. Purple. All that yeah. bouncing around on the other side doesn't matter because it was all on the same what? Side. Right. It's all on the same side. Thanks, sir. It's, it's, think of it like a tennis match. You can sit there and do whatever you want to do on your side, but it doesn't count till you return it across the net. And it doesn't go back across the net until that purple line. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. All, and that's why I think the little visual division things work. And you I was just it. about to say that. Yeah, map it, it out when, for yourself. That's why you have to, because they'll take you on those long trail of tears. And if, yeah, you got to know which side it's on. For sure. The whole, like, um, the firm writing up an offer and then and the firm not actually representing the buyer, they threw me off. <laughs> Of course, uh, and that's why they did it in there, but that's where you are operating from the assumption, whether you realize it or not, that if there's a firm writing an offer for a buyer, that firm must be representing the buyer. Well, yeah. that's, that, that's a fair assumption in the real world, but on a test where they literally tell you twice, the buyer doesn't have representation. At some point, you just got to take them for their word. Yeah. Right? Can you show me the, draw, the, the grid again, your drawing again? Yeah. Good. Now. 
Okay, good. All right. So look at this one. This is an example of a test question. And I'm going to give you, I want you to map it out yourself. And then we're going to see how you're doing. Okay. Bosco buyer is represented by Mary of Marathon Properties and is making an offer on the home located at 325 Carriage Court, which is listed by Lucy of Lakeshore Homes. Mary submits Bosco's offer to Lucy and Lucy presents it promptly to the seller. The, 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 they change the closing date, sign it, and send it back to Lucy. Lucy emails the changed agreement to Mary, who drops, off the, who drops the contract off with Bosco for his initials to the change date. After initialing the change, Bosco places the accepted agreement into the mail to Mary's office. At what point is a binding contract formed? Good luck. Give you about two, three minutes to map that out and think about it. Are ready to talk about it? Mm -hmm. All right, let's see yes. what we got here. So it tells us here, we've got Bosco buyer represented by Mary of Marathon Properties. That's what I put across the top. I made that my buyer side. Mm -hmm. And it's making an offer on the home located at 325 Carriage Court listed by Lucy of Lakeshore Homes. I put Lucy of Lakeshore and the seller down there on the bottom. Mm -hmm. It says, Mary submits Bosco's offer. So can we agree that... We have that so far. Is everybody good with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mary submits Bosco's offer to Lucy. Okay. It says Lucy pr promptly presents it to the seller. So there's that. Mm -hmm. the, the seller changes the closing date, signs the offer, and sends it back to Lucy. Guess what? I need to go away, folks. All the arrows. All the mm -hmm. arrows. Isn't that a counter offer? Yes. Yep. Doesn't yeah. that restart the whole process? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now what we've got is the seller sends their counter offer back to Lucy. But we have to wait. All I have it says Lucy emails the changed agreement to Mary. So now yeah. does everybody mm -hmm. agree that we're here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Lucy emails the changed agreement to Mary, who drops the contract off with Bosco for his initials to the change date. After initialing the change, Bosco places the accepted agreement in the mail to Mary's office. So we'll do a different color line here. 
Bosco places it in the mail to Mary's office. At what point is a binding contract formed? Well, there isn't one. This is not a binding contract. There is not one. I did not want to communicate for it. But they didn't go back with the never It never went back. It never made it full circle. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah, yes. all things went in the toilet when they changed it, right? That's right. That, so all the, that initialing and all that stuff that happened later, they would have to write a complete new counteroffer, right? Well, no, this would this would have worked if Bosco, what if it had said Bosco mailed it to Lucy's office? Would that have completed Lucy, the loop? Yeah. Yes. That right? That would have made a contract. Or what yep. if it said Mary texted Lucy? Would that have made the contract? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yep. That would have completed the loop. The problem is that Bosco gave it to somebody on his own side when he needed to give it to somebody on the what? Well, other, other side. Other side. On the other side to make it a contract. If Mary received the mail, that was the offer that was accepted, and then it was um, communicated to Lucy, it would be a contract. Right. If Mary opens the mail and it's like, oh my gosh, I need to text this over to Lucy, that would complete the loop and we would have a contract. Does that make sense mm -hmm. for everybody? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. yes. But that never happened. So what we got is an incompleted circle. We don't have a contract. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. okay with that now? Yep. Yes. yes. All right. Let's take a look at another one. Give me another practice one here. So Sarah Beth is a buyer who's placed an offer of $450,000 on a home at 765 Elmdale Court, which is listed by Louise of XYZ Realty. Sarah Beth does not have buyer representation. The seller of 765 Elmdale receives a second lower offer from buyer Billy, who's also represented by XYZ Realty. The seller responds to both buyers with a counter offer. After two days with no further developments, the seller signs Sarah Beth's original offer of $450,000 and emails it to the listing agent, Louise. Louise then texts Sarah Beth, good news, the seller accepted your offer. At what point in time was a binding contract formed? Take your time. Travis is over there smiling because he's trying to trick us. I highlighted that sentence for a reason, folks. Did anything before that sentence actually happen? Nope. No. No. The minute, the minute the seller made the counter offer to both buyers, what happened to both offers from both buyers? They no longer oh, existed. Rejected. They no longer existed. You, you, the disciplined thing to do would be just to go, none of this crap ever happened. Mm -hmm. Because that counter offer obliterated everything before. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. So here's what you have seller makes a counter offer. Two days, nothing happens. 
So the seller tries to go back and sign an original offer, which does not exist. Um, because they, they killed it with their what? Counter offer. With their counter offer. What's the answer, folks? Or no binding or contract. Or. Dang. No contract. It's a doozy. No it contract. takes back fees. There no oopsie takes back. Mm -hmm. That counter offer. Kills it every time. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Right. Yeah. So no, it was tricky. It is tricky. And you so you're gonna get a lot of practice with those and, and you need it. You'll need it. Um, so basically make oh, sure when you go back through your homework, you're looking at this idea of communication of acceptance because it's gonna be huge. When you, you've got to make sure that the knowledge has filtered through to both sides of the transaction, and also be careful that your counter offer hasn't snuck in there along the way and blown the whole thing up and started it over. Right? Remember, as soon as you see counter offer, anything be uh, before that did not happen at all, ever. There's no accepting that offer because it didn't happen. Does that make sense for everybody? Yep. I mean, yes. One question. What was that? I'm, I'm confused about what constitutes a counteroffer. If they just cross out the date and initial it, you said that was that's that a counteroffer. The contract could go forward. The contract can go forward, but it's a counteroffer. So that means it has to be accepted again by the other side. So that okay. a counteroffer just restarts the cycle. It doesn't eliminate anything, it just restarts the cycle. Now you got to have all the way to go around the loop all the way again. All right. Uh, now, in, in regards to what we were speaking about this morning, once the counter offer is made, what is the term that is called? It is not. It doesn't make the it doesn't make the offer void. What the offer it, what never existed. Sense? The offer okay. never existed. It, there is no term for it. It literally was a figment of your imagination at that point. That offer okay. never happened. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So make sure that you look at those communication of acceptance. Last couple of things we need to talk about here in this chat, uh, this section, and then we're done. And I know I'm about a minute over my time, but it won't take but a second here. You need to know this word contingency. A contingency is a let me get out and not lose my money clause in a contract. Anytime, and mostly these protect buyers, they sometimes protect sellers, but anytime a buyer is basically saying, I need the ability to get out of this contract. I need the ability to be able to walk away and get my money back without losing anything. You could insert a contingency. Now, a contingency is not going to be like it covers all things. Contingencies are going to be very specific. If I fall and break my ankle, I can get out of the contract and get my money back. Isn't that's a very specific contingency, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now that's not a very likely contingency, though. What, what do you think is more likely? What things do you think a buyer might say that are more likely to put as contingencies in a contract that if this happens, I should be able to get out and get my money back without any penalty? Property inspection. If the Financing. inspection comes back bad. Yep, there, there's one. What, what was the other one? I missed it. Financing. Financing. The appraisal. Financing. Appraisal, appraisal, right? Those are big ones that a buyer might say. If I can't get a loan, then I should be able to get out and get my money back. That's a fair contingency. Would everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. If the property doesn't appraise, I should be able to get out and get my money back. Here's what you need to understand about these contingencies. If they protect the buyer... Who are they inherently bad for in the contract? The seller. The seller. The seller. Because these allow the buyer to weasel out without paying any penalty. That's not a good thing. Here's what I also want you to understand, because I think sometimes this gets lost in the shuffle. Do sellers have to accept contingencies from buyers? Or could, yeah. a, could a seller refuse an offer just on the basis of a contingency in it? Yes. Yes. And mm -hmm. especially when they're getting a bunch of offers, if you were the seller right now and you got 10 offers and one of them came in and said, if the house doesn't appraise, I can get out and get all my money back. But the other nine did not have that contingency in it. Do you think no. the one that did would be the one you would accept or would no. the other, would you no. accept one of the other nine? 
one of the other nine. That's one of the other nine that did not have such a contingency. How many contingencies does a seller want to see in a contract? Zero. None. Zero. Buyer wants one for everything. They want the they want the I had Mexican food and it gave me gas contingency. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They want the, I stubbed my toes so I should be able to get out and get my money back contingency. The buyer wants every contingency they can get. The seller doesn't want any of them. That's going to be part of the negotiation process in going under contract. Are we all good on what a contingency is? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then remember, these would be in the contract from its very beginning. So everybody would understand the buyer has these protections built into the contract. The, so the, the, it would be part of the original offer. It's not something that's going to be added after we're under contract. These, these contingencies would be there as part of the buyer's original offer. So the seller would have to accept these contingencies. And they could be for really any number of things. How about I need to sell my house first? contingency could we have that yeah not in this market but yeah right the seller's probably okay. not going to accept it but a buyer could ask for it for sure can so generally thinking generally speaking when you think of contingency think of that as something that's good for the buyer and bad for the seller because they allow the buyer an out if a buyer signs a contract with no contingencies can they get out and get their money back or are they going to are they breaching for any reason? They breaching. They're breaching. breaching. They don't close. Yeah. They're breaching, right? Mm -hmm. Does this happen a lot in a buyer's market? Mm -hmm. Yes. You said the more you get to a buyer's market, the more contingencies you see. If you're in a market where sellers, and that's exactly right, Mary, it is conditions, right? Uh, and that's a contingency is a condition. It's the same thing. But yes, Mandy, when you're when you're in a buyer's market, you'll see lots of contingencies pop up in contracts because the buyers have the upper hand. But when you're in a seller's market, what do you think we're seeing right now? Like none. No contingencies. No contingencies. Oh, yeah. Closing right. in five days. No contingencies. <laughs> shut up and take my money. That's what you see right now. And, uh, and, and uh, no because, because it's not that the buyers don't want the contingencies. Of course they do. Buyers want these protections, but the sellers aren't willing to agree to them right now because they don't have to, because there'll be another buyer who will make an offer who doesn't have these contingencies in place. So when you're doing this negotiation back and forth and you're having counter offer after counter offer after counter offer, right? Yep. Um, at what point do you just say, well, we just got to write a whole new offer? I generally, so here's generally how, I, quite honestly, in the real world, how I handle it. I don't ever put counter offers into writing until we've gotten people to agree to the basic terms of them. For me, we handle our counter offers verbally or through email or something like that. And we'll just go back to them and say, okay, no, we counter you with this number. And if they say, yeah, we're good with that number, then we would write it up and we would send it. Now we are taking a chance because it's not binding to do it that way, but it, to me, it's the more sensible approach. Yeah. We already talked about this, but I just want to make sure and remind you one more time, making these changes to pre-printed forms. We cannot make changes for clients or customers to the language on oh. these pre-printed forms, but we can make changes if we are the one of the parties. So if Jonas is the buyer, can he as a licensee make a change on that contract? Can he mark out a whole paragraph if he wants to? Yes. 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 Can Grant change five days to seven days for a buyer client of his oh no, no not for a client no not for a client not for a customer we are we are not attorneys and we cannot do that so don't delete language don't add language don't change language in a pre-printed contract for clients or customers i've given you a list here for reference purposes on the exam anything that we don't sign, that's the best way to think of it. When they're asking you if it's okay for the licensee to make an adjustment to the language, just think to yourself, is the licensee signing this thing? So let me throw this out there. Lease. Can a licensee who's not the landlord, who's not the tenant, make a change to a lease? No. No, because they're not going to what? 
They're going to live there. They're sign gonna, it. They're not going to sign it. Sign they're it. not signing it. They're not a party to that lease. The, par the lease is between the landlord and tenant. Think about it in those terms. Can um, TT make a change when she's the listing agent on a transaction, um, but her, se her seller client asks her to make a change to it? Can she make that change? Yeah. No. No. We no. know, yeah. Because, oh, TT, yeah, because TT is not the buyer or the seller. She's not going to sign that agreement. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can Summer make a change to a buyer agency agreement between her office and her client? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because who's going to sign the buyer agency agreement? Folks, you're making it way harder than it is. <laughs> who's going to sign the buyer agency agreement? The agent. Summer. Yeah. If she's signing the agreement, she can change it. If she's not <laughs> signing the agreement, guess what? She cannot change it. She cannot change it. It literally is that simple. Claudia is a buyer's agent, and the buyer has indicated that they would rather not pay an earnest money deposit, and they want her to delete the paragraph about earnest money deposits. Can she make this change? Yes. Yes. Say that again. Claudia is a buyer's agent, and the buyer wants to not pay an earnest money deposit, and they want her to, on their sales contract, oh, no, delete no, the no. paragraph about earnest money deposits. No. No, no. I'm not part yeah. of the contract. No, she's not part of that contract. Who are the people that sign? You have to stop and ask yourself, who would be signing that sales agreement? Who are they? The buyer and the seller. The buyer and the seller, and she ain't either one of them. So she can't change it. But she can put zero in the line where you're supposed to put the but That's amount. filling in a blank. Right, yeah. that's not deleting the paragraph. She can always oh, fill in a blank. She can't delete okay. a paragraph. Kayla is a listing agent um, selling her own personal home and decides she wants to delete the entire paragraph about due diligence. Can she make this change? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, because she's going to be signing that contract because she is the seller. Does that make sense for everybody? Uh -huh. Yeah. Jonas is a listing agent and the seller is concerned about a paragraph in the listing agreement. So Jonas agrees to delete the paragraph from the listing agreement. Can Jonas legally make this change at the request of his client? Oh, I'm gonna no. say it again. Jonas is a listing agent and his client, the seller has asked him to delete a paragraph from the listing agreement because the client does not like the paragraph yeah, and Jonas agrees to delete the paragraph from the listing agreement at the yes. seller's request. Can he make this change? Yes. 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 yes because he's going to what? Agreement. It's sign it. agreement. He is going to sign the listing agreement. So he is free to make that change, whether it's because the seller asked for it or whether it's because he wanted to do it. Since he's signing the agreement, he can make the change, folks. Yes. It's all about is the agent in question signing that agreement? How many more you want me to give you? 35? They're always going to be the same answer. 70. Can I ask you a question? Yes. The, the, the agent signs the listing agreement, but they don't sign the buyer's agreement? They do. The agent, oh, okay. would sign, the agent would sign the buyer agency agreement. The agent would sign the listing agreement. The agent, okay. would, the agent would not sign a purchase agreement. Right. The agent would not sign a lease, not okay. unless they were the buyer, not unless they were the tenant, you know, then they would. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes. So always ask yourself, what document is being signed and is the agent signing it? If they are signing it, can they make the change? Yes. yes, they are signing yes. yes. All right, one more chance. Mm -mm. I'll let you go. Yeah, one more chance. Redeem yourself. You ready? Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody ready? Yeah. Okay. Rachel is the listing broker for 123 Main Street. And the seller is very hard to deal with. 
she's executed an exclusive right to sell listing agreement with the seller, place the property on the market, they receive an offer from a buyer. The seller wants Rachel to make a change to the buyer's offer on the sales contract. Rachel refuses, noting that she's not an attorney in North Carolina. The seller becomes upset and Rachel, as a show of good faith, agrees to delete the paragraph from the listing agreement calling for her firm to be paid a bonus if they sell the property by this weekend. Has Rachel operated within North Carolina license law by refusing to make the change for the seller on the sales contract and agreeing to make the change to the listing agreement for the seller. Yes. 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 yes she has done precisely the right thing. She should have refused to make the change to the sales contract because she doesn't what? Sign it. She doesn't sign it. sign it. Can she agree to make the change to the listing agreement since as the agent, yes. she signs the listing yes. agreement? Yes. 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 Bingo. There you go. That was a long question that we have. Wow. <laughs> it is, but do you understand it now? Yes. 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 That's yes. what it is. You, and you're going to see that on the test for sure, because it's, it's tricky, right? Until you get it. But now once you get it, you got it. You know, it's just simple as. You got to get the got to get the get. Exactly. That's exactly it. You really just have to ask yourself, okay, this agreement they're talking about, does the agent that they're asking me about sign the thing? If they do, then they can change whatever they want to. If they don't sign it, they can't change anything about it. Mm -hmm. Everybody good with that? Yes. Okay. Good. Well, that completes 8.2, folks.